Hi everyone, I am back and I'm going to be more and more back. I think I'm at JLF meeting some wonderful authors and right now I'm with Katie Hickman and with her book with her longish name, She Merchants, Buccaneers and Gentlewomen, British Women in India. Well, uh, I think I would uh, like to begin with that famous statement uh, I was just reading up uh, on um, about how it was the woman of the Raj that uh, gave it away. I know. What you're going so to what say. was the what was the I know what, you're going what to was the exact line? I think it was David Lean. Uh-huh. Is it David Lean? David yeah, Lean was one of it our was. film directors who said, if it wasn't for the British, British women, we never would have lost the empire. But of course, he was a man, wasn't he? <laughs> so maybe he would say that. But from where did that, uh, uh, that come, I mean, uh, from where, where did, did it this... come? Well, I mean, it is true to say that, you know, the, the kind of classic memsub is not a very attractive person. You know, she's the racist, snobbish, idle, you know, um, woman who, who gave British women in India a bad name. And I think that there were people like that. I think there were plenty of women who were deeply racist and deeply snobbish and all of those things. But I think that there were also a huge number of women who were not that and who were the opposite of that. And they have never really had their story told. And my book is particularly concentrates on the really early ladies who came to came to this country so what i would say i describe them as being east india company rather than the raj and i didn't really want to write about the raj ladies because well we kind of know about them already it seems to me that they've been written about quite a lot already but the women who came out from the I and mean, when I say early, I mean really early. I mean from the time of Shakespeare. So 1617, the first two British women to travel to India. So in the 17th century and the 18th century, they came in very small numbers, but they did come and they did really interesting things. Uh, um, who were these women who came in those times? And who were they? Well, and they were brought the to the first, purpose, I'm sure. So the, the, the first two that are a good example because in their stories they kind of encapsulate, you know, all the possibilities. The first two were was a woman called Mrs. Hudson and another woman called Mrs. Steele, Frances Steele. And they were the ones who sailed in 1617 and they did it against the rules. So they, they kind of circumvented the East India Company who forbade women on their voyages. Was a, but they, these two were able to get round the rules because they were the companions, sort of female attendants to a third woman whose name was Mrs. Towerson. And she was an Indian lady who married an English sea captain. She was actually an Armenian Christian from Agra who married, in fact, two English sea captains, a man called William Hawkins... And the marriage was arranged by the Mughal Emperor, by the Mughal Emperor Jahangir. And Same William Hawkins who finds a mention in William Dalrymple's book? Absolutely right. Oh. Yes, exactly the same one. So the first man to make contact with the, with the Mughal Emperor, he became a drinking companion to the Emperor um, Jahangir. You know, like a good Englishman, he was very good at, uh, at drinking. And I believe <laughs> your Emperor was very good at drinking as well. So they became sort of, you know, companions... William Hawkins was very afraid that he was being poisoned by the Jesuits, the Portuguese at the Mughal court. And so the, sh- the emperor said, well, I have an idea. I will give you a wife and then your wife can be in charge of the cooking and then you can be sure that you won't be poisoned. And he found this Indian lady and so w- William Hawkins married her. And it seems to have been rather successful. It's quite a romantic story. I think they quite loved one another. Anyway... It had a sad ending mm-hmm. because they, uh, she went back to England with him and he died on board the ship. And so she then married, she then married a, a second English sea captain whose name was Mr. Towson. And she was on her way back to Agra. On her way back to Agra. And in need of these two... A women attendants, Mrs. Mm. Hudson and Mrs. Steele, who went with her, and so they were able to, you know, go, get past the get past the rules. And Mrs. Steele married a sailor on board another ship and ended up having a baby, much to the horror of the English um, merchants. 
so she's probably the first English woman to have a to give birth on the on the shore. And the second one, Mrs. Hudson, took her life savings with her, hundred pounds, which was a lot of money then, about twenty thousand pounds today. She put all her money into cloth, buying cloth. So she was the she merchant of the title of my book. And she made a fortune out of it. When she went home in 1719, just the freight alone on her on her wonderful, you know, supply of cloth was seventy pounds, so nearly the amount of the of her initial outlay. So she made herself a fortune against all the expectations of the men of the men, you know, men merchants who were there. So I like those I like those two very much. They were incredibly adventurous. You know, it was a long, dangerous journey. Eight months in a ship, no bigger than two double-decker buses. I mean, tiny. Evidently, and ships of those days were never yeah, friendly to women. Never friendly to women. No, you're exactly right. Women were unlucky. They didn't let them go up on the deck. You know, they had to stay in the bowels of the of the ship. They had sea wrecks. You know, shipwrecks. They had terrible storms. It was a very dangerous undertaking. But they went anyway. And people often say, why did they go? Why did they go? And I think they just went because they wanted an adventure. I really think it was as simple as that. Men wanted to have adventures. Why shouldn't women have an adventure? So, you know, bring it on. Yeah. But then I just observed one thing that even the English maids who were so frivolous, supposedly so frivolous, had come and it was so unfortunate that they had to live in India, a place where it was not, uh, which was completely alien to them and have had nothing to do. Yes, I think that was. I I'm think sure you're absolutely right. Been, I, I, yeah, I yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I think <laughs> I think that's right. I think there are many problems associated with British women who came to India, but once you start looking at the individual stories, you can't help but have sympathy with them. So the more you know about someone's life, the more you can empathise with them, and you know even. Even the most, the biggest battle axe, you know, the biggest, most terrible battle axe was, was, you know, living in a culture that was not her own culture. They, they were immigrants, really. I mean, the early, early women in the 17th century were no different to any other immigrant group with all that that implies. You know, there were so few of them and they were encountering a culture that was so dramatically different from theirs. And that where women lived in a way that was so dramatically different from anything that they knew, they had a climate that was wildly different from their own temperate, soft, rainy, grey climate that we have in England. You know, the, the Indian sun killed, sure. killed people. And it was, you know, it was a big adjustment for them. So you can't, once you know about those struggles, however, however privileged they may seem on the surface of it, you can't help but, um, you know, you can't help but feel empathy for them for what they were having to and, and, and go through. When you discover the stories, and when you have so many stories to say, and one of the, I think, men, they, they were, they, your book has been applauded for being so original in its content and, and mm. all the research that you have done. But doesn't it have too much of content? And how I'm sure this too is much just, of too much of uh, too many. Uh, it was only been uh, the only thing that I thought was a uh, little a little on the grey side was that there was too much content to take in. Oh, too right. many stories. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, so I did. Well, I'm sure there were I mean, you discovered. Uh, um, what more you discovered? Rather. I mean, I'm hoping that that's an error on the right side, as we say. <laughs> but yes, it's but it is bulging with stories. And honestly, I could have. It could have been twice the length. But luckily for you, it's not. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> and the thing I regret is that I was not able to tell the stories of more Indian women. Mm-hmm. But it was very difficult, you know. In a in a you know. British women were really good at writing things down. They were obsessed with writing diaries, obsessed with writing letters. And so their their experiences are very well documented in a way that is hard to find the equivalent amongst Indian amongst Indian women who are marvelously good at storytelling, you know, their oral history. Um, but that's from the historian's point of view, that is much less easy to kind of pin down. Um so, yeah. so it's it, British women are really good at leaving, leaving a paper trail behind them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It is, yeah. Uh, there are those these many stories, I'm <laughs> sure. But uh, one odd, one odd story that you really are uh, kind of affected by or inspired oh, okay. by. 
Maybe you could tell um, us. Well, I, the first two that I was talking about, I'm very uh, um, full of admiration for them. Then there was, was the she merchant. The she merchant. There were other she merchants, but she was the original she merchant, Mrs. Hudson. Um, then yes. I think there was a story, uh, one of the very later stories, and in fact, a relative of one of those women was here today at the festival. I was so fascinated to meet her. There were two women who came out as nurses during the big plague epidemic in Bombay, the very end of the, ni of the 19th century. So 18, I hope I get the state right, 1898, I think it was. So a big plague, bubonic plague. And a lot of English nurses came, volunteered to come to, you know, to help out. And one of them, a woman called Hester May Dowson, wrote these letters back to her family. And these letters have survived in the British Library in a tiny little, you know, literally like written in an old-fashioned typewriter, stapled together with an old-fashioned staple, one copy. It was really done for her family. But one of these has, has survived in the British Library. And it's the letters describing how they arrived, how they lived together, they supported one another throughout this terrible epidemic. You know, people were dying, you know, maybe 10 or 20 of their patients would die during the course of one one day alone. And they really, really sympathised with them and they didn't approve of the English doctors who were very rough and very brusque with them and who didn't really respect the cultural sensitivities that were, that were there. And these English women were much better at empathising with their patients. And then one day, one of the patients coughed and some of the sputum went into the eye of this of Hester May's friend um, MacDougall, Harriet MacDougall went into her eye and she also caught the plague and these letters are so touching because Hester May tried to nurse her friend all through this plague and her temperature went up and up and up, her temperature was 106 and eventually she realised that she was dying and eventually she, she dies but you get this blow by blow You know, these letters back to her family saying, it could have been me, it could have been me, it could have been me dying in this faraway place. And the relative of this woman, Harriet McDougall, was here at the festival today. It was an amazing, amazing sort of, you know, correspondence of things. So there are stories from the late 19th century, there are stories from the early 17th century. But they all, they're all different, and yet they all have this common theme, which is women who've kind of gone out into the world and had an adventure of some kind and it may not have ended well, but they pushed themselves as people and that's, you know no matter what the backdrop was a very problematic backdrop for a historian the backdrop of the Raj in India, you know, with all the problems and uh, difficulties that that could, can have for an English historian It's still, the human stories are very touching. You also write a lot of fiction, so here, here mm. I'm just hoping that you will come up with a book based, a fiction based on history of any yes, of Yes, well, that would be very wonderful, yes, yeah. absolutely. What it are your would, plans? it would. Well, I don't have any plans, but you might well have inspired me, <laughs> because actually there are stories that I would like to have told that are, I, I kind of have like a tantalizing glimpse of them, For example, in the 17th century, when the British acquired Bombay through the marriage dowry of Catherine, the Portuguese princess Catherine of Braganza, uh, there were very young women from, a, from an orphanage who made the way there, but they have no names, I know nothing about them, the only way to write about them would be in fiction. That would be wonderful. So, I'm hoping for a lot more from you from that era. Okay. Thank you so much. Such Kate. a pleasure. pleasure. And it, was, it was wonderful speaking to you. Okay, thank See you, you very much. Bye. Great.